Let's now take a look at another Ali Echin game, and this time he was white against former world champion Emmanuel Lasker from 1934. Now, the reason I've chosen this game is because, well, it's not Ali Echin's most spectacular game, that's for sure. However, it is rather cute in the way he finished off the former world champion. And I think it's another demonstration of just how Aliyechin managed to uh, create an attack out of nothing. That was really what he was famous for. Kasparov once quoted that his attacks came uh, out of the sky like a lightning bolt. You didn't know they were coming. And this was one great example of that. Lasker, who was of course, a renowned defender, didn't manage to find a way to hold the position together in this game. And White finished him off in a very neat fashion. So let's have a look at this. And Aliehin often opened with d4, and we reach a very standard Queen's Gambit declined position. Knight bd7. Later, the move h6 would become all the rage. In fact, this is still seen as the main line nowadays going into what's called a Tartakova variation. But knight bd7 is not bad. e3, castles, rook c1, c6, all very standard stuff. And here, bishop d3. Um, Aliechin has also experimented with queen c2. But bishop d3 is by far the most natural move here, developing the bishop. And black waits for the bishop to be developed before he takes the pawn on c4, uh, essentially saying that he has won a tempo by making the bishop move twice. So here Lasker took on c4. In a, a more recent game between Karpov and Yusupov from 1989, Black included h6, bishop h4, and then d takes c4. And after the following moves, managed to get an advantage after a very good move, bishop b3. This is important because white gave himself an isolated queen's pawn, but by doing this, gave the rook a chance to play an important role in the attack. And also the fact that black is still undeveloped, his rooks aren't connected, white can seize the open file. So here, white had a slight advantage in the game Karpov Yusupov, not to mention this pressure down on the f7 point. So even Yusupov's slight finesse over 50 years later uh, wasn't quite enough to maintain equality. However, in the game, after d takes c4, bishop takes c4, knight d5, takes, takes. So the move castles would have led to an identical position to what we just saw, except that here after e5, the pawn isn't on h6, but it's on h7. What's the big difference? Well, it's minor but it's probably better on h7 because it controls g6 and sometimes a piece can land there because of this pin. So that's interesting. Aliechin though avoided all of this and played the move knight e4 instead. He wasn't happy exchanging so many pieces. He didn't like to be uh, taken to these dull end games which are reasonably sterile in nature. Uh, instead, knight e4 kept some pieces on. The knight, of course, has options. It controls c5, controls g5. Whether it's uh, objectively good enough for an advantage is a totally another matter, though, but an interesting move. Knight 5 f6, okay, so he retreats. And now knight g3 by Aliechin. So he keeps the knight on. Of course, he could have come back this way, but that 
a repetition wasn't something that Ali Echin wanted. And taking on f6, well, that makes some sense, but even here, either recapture looks like it's fine for black. I assume Lasker would have taken with the queen, the point being that e5 is now still a threat and there's no way for white to stop that. So Aliyehin tried to mix things up with knight g3 and the point is that now after e5 does he have something else up his sleeve? Another Aliyehin um, match saw queen b4 check and this was against Capablanca. Um, in their match. And here, after the exchange of queens and rook d8, Aliechin felt that he always had the upper hand, but it wasn't ever quite enough to uh, convincingly beat Capablanca from this position. So those games ended in a draw. Another idea was after king takes d2, rook uh, c5 which was played much later on in 1939, again Aliechin with white and uh, after the following moves, well the position was about equal, that was against Stahlberg at the Buenos Aires Olympiad. So Aliechin believed in this position with white, clearly having played it in so many different games he felt there should be a little something something, although black was always very close to equality. Well in the game Queen b4 check wasn't played by Lasker, but instead the move e5, the principled move, which he wants, the freeing move. And why does he want to play e5? Well, because he wants to allow his bishop to come out. And once that bishop comes out successfully, then he will have equalized. For example, here, a move like d5 and exchanging the piece off is nothing for white, because now black is free to develop the bishop somewhere along the diagonal. So after e5, actually, white castled. e takes d4. And now the question is, what to do with white? How should he proceed here? What do you think Alekhine played? Did he take the pawn back? If so, how? Or was there something else? Very interesting position. Well, over to you. Have a think about it and try and guess what Alekhine played and join me in part two to see exactly what happened in this game. So e takes d4 was just played by Lasker, and many of us would recapture that pawn almost instantaneously. Uh, queen takes d4, knight takes d4, even e takes d4, they all come to mind, but actually Alekhine, with his fantastic imagination for the attack, played knight f5. Now the knight on f5, is often a very dangerous piece. It is uh, a nightmare to defend against uh, a lot of the time, especially when our g7 point is weak. And Aliechin felt that this was worth a go. Objectively, black should still be okay, but psychologically speaking, playing this move might have shocked Lasker a bit, who may have just been expecting white to recapture on d4. So knight f5 here attacks the queen as well, gaining a tempo. The queen came back and now knight e takes, uh, knight uh, 3 takes d4. Uh, queen takes d4 instead was nothing because after knight b6, black achieves a mass exchange. And one rule of thumb for attacks in chess is that if you are the attacking side, you want to keep as many pieces on as possible. Here, after knight b6, the queen, the knight, the bishop, they're all under attack. So something is going to come off. And the less pieces there are, the less pieces there are to attack with. So knight 3 takes d4, knight e5 was played, and now bishop b3. c5 was threatened, and the knights would be uh, unprotected. So bishop b3 here. So Aliechin has got some pressure. He maintains on f7. He's kept the pieces on g7 as well. But black should still be okay. B6. 
because after takes, knight takes f5, well, this was a critical moment in the game. Here, Lasker played queen b6, but maybe this wasn't such a good move. Can you see why this might be the case? Well, Aliechin, a bit like a sniffer dog, a police sniffer dog, searching for the weaknesses in Black's position, felt that the queen on b6 was misplaced. The queen comes away from the king's side, and now White has an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that Black has only a few defenders. This knight is very important, and Aliechin found the move queen d6, which is a very strong move. And suddenly, Black is in a lot of trouble. White is threatening the knight on e5 but is also indirectly threatening the knight on f6 were this g7 point to be removed. So what to do here? Well, knight e d7 was played, and that might be the best move. It seems as though after this that black's game is very difficult. So instead of queen b6, the move g6 was absolutely essential, kicking that knight away. And the point is that after queen d4, well, knight d6, queen e7 is nothing for white. So queen d4, you can just take that off and rook a d8. And here, of course, white has got close to nothing. It should be a draw. So after queen d6, Lasker probably gulped and realized, oh no, I've created some real problems here. Well, knight ed7 was played. Just to give a few sample lines, if knight g6, knight h6 check is annoying for black. And having to take this knight off ruins the structure. Queen takes f6, and then keeping the queens on with queen c3. Of course, white is now much better, thanks to his superior pawn structure, the weakened black king and the continual weakness on f7. Also, a move like rook fe8 here, just keeping hold of the knight, runs into knight e7 check, and uh, white wins material. So, knight e d7 was forced, rook f d1, bringing the last piece into play, rook a d8, and now queen g3. That's a nice move. Threatening mate. Well, there's only really one move here, and that's to play g6, and now Aliechin continued with his attack, queen g5. And this move ties black down, threatens a number of things. Rook d6 looks like a huge threat to me, just threatening to win this piece. And black already was close to lost here. King h8, well, knight d6 attacking f7. The king came to g7. And now white has got all of his pieces in decent places, on decent squares. But he needs to find a breakthrough. He needs to find a way to ramp up the pressure just that bit more to make black concede. So how did he increase the potency of his attack? Have a look at the position, think about it, and see if you can find the move that Alakine played in the game. Well, with all of his pieces working, it seems that there should be something, but maybe a tiny bit more help would be useful. And here, the move e4 is an excellent move by Aliechin. Not only does it introduce another piece into the attack, and yes, 
that pawn is a piece because once it gets rolling, it really helps in the attack. And Kasparov would often, in his own terminology, claim that such pawns are not just mere pawns, but that is a piece, that is another piece in the attack. And with so many pieces already there, there should be something decisive. But not only does it introduce this threat, but also, now that the third rank is clear, I'm sure ideas of a rook swing, either with the C or D rooks, was in Aliyekin's mind. So E4 is an excellent multi-purpose move. Well done, if you saw that. Well, what to do? Knight G8, black's rooks are pretty tied down. There's not so much he can do here. So knight g8 trying to control some squares. Now rook d3. So we see the idea of coming to f3 to h3 and so on. f6, black really couldn't stand the, pre the uh, pressure. Knight f5 check, king h8. So White has given a check, but black has slightly gone to the corner, and suddenly white has got both his queen and knight on prees to these pawns. Surely Aliakin saw this. Surely he didn't just blunder a piece in this much better position, did he? Have a look and see if you can find what Aliakin had in mind. Well, yes, it's a great finish and just goes to show how quickly his attacks developed. Queen takes g6 is brilliant, a masterful stroke. Now that the rook is on d3, the point is that after h takes g6, as I'm sure you've all seen, rook h3 check leads to checkmate on h6. And if you don't play h takes g6, well, Queen g7 mate is coming. So literally out of nowhere, barely 10 moves earlier, black seemed to be totally equal. And with one small inaccuracy, queen b6, Aliakin managed to take advantage and drum up what was a decisive attack. So another demonstration of Aliakin's imagination, this idea of knight g3, knight f5, but also his ability to swiftly bring his pieces into an attack and win very convincing games. Um, he managed to make the best of the best fold quite early on. They didn't manage to withstand the pressure of his attacks. And even Lasker, a former world champion, was on the receiving end of a standard Alakine crush in this game. So I hope you've learned a few ideas from that particular example, and I hope that it goes on to help you in your own games when you are on the attack yourselves. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.